Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar, How the U.S. Supreme Court Shaped the Definition of Bovis, Waters of the United States, and What It Means Going Forward. My name is Elena Berg, and I am a planner in the Environment and Development Department of the North Central Texas Council of Governments, or NCT COG, and I will be moderating this webinar. This webinar is hosted by NCT COG and was prepared in cooperation with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Just to give you some brief background on what NCT COG is, NCT COG is a voluntary association of local governments. It is one of 24 regional councils in Texas. As part of NCT COG's water quality management planning work, we host webinars on water quality topics every quarter. If you have ideas for future topics for these webinars, please feel free to send them to me. I'd love to hear them. My email address is shown on the screen as e berg at nctcog.org. At this time, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will last until two o'clock Central Daylight Time. We will hear one presentation given by three outstanding speakers. And after the presentation, there will be limited time for questions. Instructions on how to submit your questions will be provided at that time. This webinar is being recorded and the recording and the presentation slides will be posted under the green banner called webinars on NCT COG's website. And the website link is shown on your screen. You should be able to just click it from there. And I also put the link in the chat. Follow-up emails about today's webinar will be sent to all those who registered. If you did not register and you would like to receive these emails, just send me an email at eberg at nctcog.org and I'll be sure that you are included on those emails. And just a friendly reminder, please keep your microphone on mute until we get to the question and answer period. We have a lot of people and we would like to, we would like to reduce the background noise. So thank you for that. And here is the webinar agenda for today. We have our one presentation, which will get into the analysis and implications of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Sackett versus Environmental Protection Agency. And then we'll take some time for questions and we will wrap up and we'll be done at two o'clock. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. All of our speakers today are partners with the firm Best Best and Krieger LLP. The first speaker I will introduce is Andre Monette. Andre works extensively with water districts, cities, counties, and agricultural interests on matters involving the Federal Clean Water Act. Andre has also testified before the United States Senate Environment and Public Works Committee on the jurisdictional reach of the Clean Water Act and proposed revisions to the definition of waters of the United States. The second speaker I will introduce is Rebecca Andrews. Rebecca works with public agencies in Texas and throughout the United States to address complex environmental issues. Rebecca represents public agencies in matters related to wastewater, stormwater, land use, and property development. The third speaker I will introduce today is Lowry Crook. Lowry advises and represents public and private clients on water infrastructure, the Clean Water Act, environmental review and permitting, ecosystem restoration, and disaster resilience and recovery issues. Lowry has served in senior positions at the White House and federal agencies, including the Army Corps of Engineers. And with that, I would like to welcome our speakers, and I now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Elena. It's really a, a wonderful privilege to be here. Um, we'll be talking about the implications of the uh, the Sackett case and what it means for municipalities and uh, and public agencies in general. Uh, and um, you know, I think focusing more on the implications and practical side of things uh, because there's more to come, obviously, on this issue. Uh, a little bit about more background on me. Uh, I've been working, and Rebecca and Lowry, along with me, have been working with a coalition of of cities and water providers uh, on this issue since. 2014 in some capacity or another, either submitting comments or amicus briefs or, uh, you know, in some cases, yeah, uh, writing letters, talking to folks, whatever we could do to make sure that help, we can help shape the outcome in a way that favors municipal operations. Uh, 
Um, and so we have a long history here and, and we worked with Lisa Sornan, who, who uh, you heard from previously on this case, uh, and we're very pleased to work with her on a number of amicus briefs. So um, that's just a little bit of background. We can go to the next slide. Um, I think one of the important things for me that, that you guys get out of this today is sort of a, a feeling for the evolution of, of this issue. I mean, the puns will just keep coming. Uh, there's ebb and flow on this. There's a high watermark. Uh, and, and it's so bad that they just come. So forgive me for that. Uh, but I think it's important to start with, you know, where was the Clean Water Act before 1972 and where did it go? Uh, before 1972, the, real, the focus was really with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Rivers and Harbors Act. Um, there were various iterations improving on that Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899 to focus it more on pollution and water quality. But the fundamental bones were uh, placing the, the, the responsibility for maintaining the, the free passage of the nation's waters uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers. So a lot of that changed in 1972, especially with the definitions and uh, with that, the scope of the act, right? So the definition became the navigable waters. The Clean Water Act is to apply to the navigable waters, and that was in turn defined as the waters of the United States. Compromised position, most likely in the House and Senate, because no one could determine like how to define that appropriately. Uh, the Corps initially had uh, taken the position that, well, geez, that means we're just still doing the Rivers and Harbors Act thing. We're not going to go any much further than we've had to in the past in terms of regulating wetlands or other small tributaries. Uh, Natural Resources Defense Council challenged that in 1975 and district court in, in the District of Columbia ordered the Corps and EPA to issue new regulations going further than just that traditional Rivers and Harbors Act um, uh, regulation. So those regulations came out and they were in place and they covered wetlands and, and tributaries and small streams, uh, and which brought us to our first case, which I'll talk about on the next slide, which is uh, United States v. Riverside, v. Riverside Bayview Homes, excuse me. I'll come back to the Migratory Bird Rule Act, but we can go to the next slide here. And so again, this is United States v. Riverside Bay Bayview Homes. Probably the first, it is the first Supreme Court case on what is the scope of the Clean Water Act? What, what does what does the United States mean? Um, and this property, which is still undeveloped, was at issue in that case. It's it's uh, bordering on Lake St. Clair, which is uh, in Michigan uh, near, near Lake Erie. Uh, and uh, property developer wanted to develop it much like the areas that are surrounding it. If you look at to the right, left, the top, you got uh, you know, marinas, et cetera. Um, the proposal was to do the same with that property. Uh, and the property owner didn't like that the, the Court had determined that this property is wetlands and jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act and challenged it on the Supreme Court. Uh, the rule that came out of that decision in, in just so many words was the, that Congress and, and had meant to regulate more than just the traditional navigable waters when they passed the Clean Water Act and that wetlands that are immediately adjacent to those waters uh, can be regulated as waters of the United States. So Basic rule of law came out of the case, property bordering on uh, on navigable water is gonna be covered under the Clean Water Act if there are wetlands and it's bas basically subject to the ebb and flow of its tides. We can go to the next slide. In between Bayview Homes and this next case, Swank, uh, the Corps issued another regulation called the Migratory Bird Rule because after the, the Bayview Homes case, I think there was a feeling that Congress intended to have the, the Clean Water Act go as far as congressional authority can go meaning any, any connection to commerce, any connection to any other power. And under the treaty powers, the United States had promised to protect migratory birds with Canada. And so the Army Corps issued a rule saying, well, if migratory birds are using a property and it's wet, well, that, you know, that, that would bring it within the purview of the Clean Water Act. So the narrow issue in this Swank case was whether or not this formal gravel mine, which is shown in this picture, outside of Chicago could be developed into a landfill. And the Corps said, no, it's a wetland. It's it's subject to the Migratory Bird Rule Act and regulated on the Clean Water Act. Uh, and a solid waste agency of Northern Cook County challenged it, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, wetlands that are not directly connected in one way or another, hydrologically connected to uh, traditional navigable waters cannot be regulated uh, under the Clean Water Act or not, are not waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act. The uh, narrow rule of law is the Migratory Bird Rule Act doesn't apply. The more broad rule that came out of this and got carried forward, I think, is that that notion of lack of hydrologic connection to other surface waters that are downstream will mean that a water is, is not a waters of the United States. I would point out with this property, though, that the Fox River is not very far away. It would probably be 
a mile or less from where this property is. And there are hydrogeological reports out there that link the groundwater on this property to the water in that river. So there is a hydrological connection of some kind, but it wasn't a surface water connection or even a very shallow groundwater connection that sometimes has been raised as a basis for jurisdiction. So let's go to the next slide. So that brings us to the Rapanos case just a few years later, because again, that narrow rule of law that came out of Swank was, well, only the Migratory Bird Rule Act is overturned. So there's this, still this notion in, in, in government and in some of these regulations and the interpretation of those regulations that the definition of waters of the United States is broad and should cover a lot. So this is one of the properties, there are multiple properties at issue in this case, but this is one of them uh, and illustrates where the where the core was going. Uh, so if, if Swank was maybe the high water mark, this is the next step down, or is a wetland that is not near any kind of open water. But if you see between Craw Drive and Hibbs Drive on this on this picture, there's a storm drain. And that storm drain was draining the wetland and taking it down to ironically Lake St. Clair, not very far from where the Bayview Homes um, uh, case took place. So in that case, the court was split, right? There was, it broke three ways. There was a plurality opinion that said, that was authored by Justice Scalia that said, if there's no uh, continuous surface connection, a water's not gonna be con considered waters of the United States. There was a, uh, a, a sort of a, a more um, environmentally minded wing of the court that decided no, like I said before, Congress intended to regulate everything it possibly could under this definition. So any tie to commerce, any tie to environment, is going any tie to any kind of congressional authority is going to warrant it, allow for jurisdiction. And then there was Justice Kennedy who tried to find a middle ground and developed what's called the significant nexus test. And that test, in, under his holding, was if a water body has a, a significant nexus, meaning a, a, a have, would have a significant effect on the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the downstream navigable water, then it can be regulated as a uh, water of the United States. In some ways, this kind of, this rule comes out of some of the Commerce Clause Supreme Court jurisprudence that's out there that, that holds that uh, activities that have a significant effect on interstate commerce can be regulated by Congress. So you can see that Kennedy was maybe reaching for that rule and said, OK, well, this is a significant nexus. And if waters would have a significant effect of their own on, on downstream traditional agricultural waters, then they could be regulated. So we entered this gray area where there were five votes holding that the Rapanos properties were not likely not to be uh, waters of the United States, but it was unclear whether it was the Kennedy decision that was going to carry the day or the or the Scalia decision that was going to carry the day. Most folks followed, including EPA and President Bush at the time, President Bush's EPA followed the Kennedy um, decision. So we got guidance and regulations that were based on this significant nexus test. That brings us forward to this last case, the Sackett case, which is in the next slide. So I wanted to point out this property. Uh, this is, I, I forget which way is north. I think it's probably to the right of this picture. But the, the important thing is we've got the Sackett family property. It is between Old Schneider Road and Kellisville Bay Road uh, and has no frontage on, on this lake. Uh, notably, it's blocked off on drain, from draining by Kellisville Bay Road. Without that road there, it might have drained just to the top of the picture and then to the left down to Kalispell Creek and then out into the lake. Uh, but that road blocked drainage. So there was no surface connection, but there may have been a shallow groundwater connection. Notably also, if you looked in the Ninth Circuit decision on this, there were photos of the property that were attached as an appendix. They show open water, open ponds on this property. So not open water that you can sail on, but the open ponds and, and clearly some sort of wetland existed on this property based on those photographs. But just the question was, what's the connection and whether or not that was enough for, for jurisdiction. Uh, and so that's the that's the factual scenario of SACA. We'll go to the next slide for what I, I feel like is the black letter law coming out of it. The decision, and it split a number of different ways, but Justice Alito wrote the majority and specifically endorsed Justice Scalia's analysis from or or holding from from the uh, Rapanos case and and it broke it down three ways uh, a water is going to be a water if it's a traditional navigable water that is a stream river ocean or lake that is used for navigation and interstate commerce or flows across or forms part of state boundaries so you, the water is open water used for navigation and interstate commerce or is 
crossing a state boundary or forms a state boundary. That seems fairly straightforward, but we'll talk about it in just a second because there's still questions about what that means. Secondly, a relatively permanent standing or continuously flowing stream, river, or lake that maintains a continuous surface connection to one of these downstream traditional navigable waters. So the courts, Justice Alito spent a lot of time focusing on using words that mean something, uh, ordinary parlance, um, and focused on stream, river, lake, wetland, things that are called that and known to be that, and then have a continuous surface connection to downstream traditional navigable waters will be considered to be waters of the United States. Lastly, wetlands that are also relatively permanent and maintain a continuous surface connection in the same way. So that's the that's what I consider the black letter law to come out of this. I'm sure someone will disagree with me, but that's that I think that's fairly straightforward. Let's go to the next slide. So th these are the questions that come out of this. What does it mean to have a continuous surface connection? We know that waters dry up sometimes. We know that the tide comes in and out. We know that that you know how often does a river have to flow to be continue have it maintain that continuous surface connection? The same analysis applies to the relatively permanent. Um, uh, criteria. Sometimes things dry up for an hour. Sometimes they dry up for a month. What what is what is enough to be there? Um, and then what does it mean to be a traditional navigable water? Uh, it sounds like it should be obvious. Like we we run ferries, we run shipping down the Mississippi River. Uh, but in some cases, there are you know water bodies that that maybe are man made entirely, but they look a lot like something that could be used for commerce and navigation. And it matters mostly in the terms of where does your point source end under the Clean Water Act, and where does the water, the receiving water, begin? Uh, so there are some waters like, you know, where does the sewage treatment plant end or begin? Where does your storm drain system end or begin? Those are still in question. Um, and lastly, what we want to talk about here, and I'm going to hand it to Rebecca for that part of it, is, you know, what does this mean for infrastructure development? What does this mean for operations and management? So let's go to the next slide. So again, I, I'm going to kind of go down in that order. Um, I think. This is the least action is happening on this issue, but it's still an issue, um, and that's the traditional navigable waters. So that's a picture of Louisville Lake. Um, it's on the Trinity River. Uh, it's uh, you know I think argue it's hard to argue it's not really you know waters of the United States as a traditional navigable water. It's used for all kinds of commerce and recreation and other things, and it's on a river that's known as a river that connects down, ultimately hits the ocean. Um, you know, I think you could raise questions about what level of commerce and commercial activity takes place there, but but it's a harder sell. So that looks to me like a traditional level of water. I'm not an expert on that that aspect, but it's still have to see. Let's go to the next slide. This is what the court said in Sackett about it. They define traditional navigable waters, citing the Rapanos case, that is interstate waters that were either navigable in fact and used for interstate commerce or readily susceptible of being used in that way. This kind of goes back to, you know, what was the Corps' original jurisdiction under, under the uh, Rivers and Harbors Act. Uh, and again, it matters for water supply agencies, flood control agencies, and, and you know, cities, because it defines where, do the, where does the infrastructure end and where does the waters of the United States begin? And, it, and that matters for your point of compliance under the Clean Water Act. So if, there are waters, again, that may be never in fact, but were never intended to be used in commerce. And arguably, they probably shouldn't be traditional navigable waters, but that's an analysis that has to be done. Let's go to the next slide. Again, here's some examples. Uh, this is the canals at Las Colinas on the left, and this is Lake Longhorn on the right. Uh, the right, I'll start with, it's maybe a little bit more straightforward. It's an old quarry, doesn't drain anywhere, full of water, used for all kinds of recreational activities. What is that? Is that traditional navigable water? It's used for recreation. Is that enough commercial activity to trigger jurisdiction? Or is that is recreation alone not enough? It's not draining. It's not maintaining a surface connection downstream, but things might drain into it. Uh, on the left, the canals at Las Colinas, again, used for recreation at this point, maybe originally designed for tr transporting commerce and navigation. Maybe that's enough. But these are these are things that that are are remain open questions and will matter for cities and flood control agencies because you've got to get in there and you've got to maintain them. And, and when you go to maintain them, there could be a, a new species or something that is in there, not the species itself, maybe it's critical habitat, and, and it makes things a lot more difficult and complex. So go to the next slide, please. So this is really where the action is coming from this case. 
Um, what does it mean to be a continuous surface connection? What does it mean to be relatively permanent? And so what's at issue here? Um, ephemeral streams and connected wetlands, streams that flow intermittently, infrastructure built adjacent to those things. Are they going to get wrapped in? Are they touching those things? Let's go to the next slide. So this is what the court had to say about what it means to have a continuous surface connection or what they felt. You know, waters may be fairly read to include only those wetlands that are, as a practical matter, indistinguishable from waters of the United States, such that it is difficult to determine where the water ends and the wetland begins. That occurs when wetlands have a continuous surface connection to bodies that are waters of the United States in their own right, so that there's no clear demarcation between waters and wetlands. Okay, that sounds like it's got to be flowing all the time, right? Then, right at the end, caveat that opens the whole thing. We also acknowledge that temporary interruptions in surface connections may sometimes occur because of phenomenon like low tides and dry spells. Well, how long? We don't know. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is an interesting thing. This is quotes from Justice Scalia's decision in Rapanos. And we know Justice Scalia passed away some years ago, no longer on the court, took no part in the Sackett decision. But the Rapanos case is cited and endorsed in the Sackett decision. And the analysis from that and Scalia's decision in that is brought forward. So I think you can rely on that as also binding law for, for some of these issues. And what did he have to say about that? We do not ex necessarily exclude seasonal rivers, which contain continuous flow during some months of the year, but no flow during dry months, such as the 290-day continuous flowing stream. The phrase does not include channels through which water flows intermittently or ephemerally, or channels that periodically provide rainfall drainage for rainfall. So a little more nuance from Justice Scalia, but we, you know, this is not an easy issue. So, so that's where we are. So go to the next slide. And this is kind of like where it matters. And we want to show this picture. If you start in top center, that looks like a prairie pothole, probably has water in it a lot, uh, but, it, it, but it may not have a continuous surface connection downstream. It might be totally isolated. If so, you know, under this analysis, probably not WOTUS, it may be. On the bottom left, um, uh, groundwater infiltration basins. Those are designed not to drain downstream, but if you look carefully, the language in the decision from Sackett doesn't say downstream connection. If the continuous surface connection is from an upstream water, quite possibly you could assert jurisdiction that way. I mean, that's that's novel, but it's possible. Um, the point is, these things look and act like wetlands, and and it looks like in some cases they may be captured unless there is full control over the water that leaves and comes in. Uh, on the right bottom is a dry wash. Again, that, that's sort of the issue that presents itself as how often does that thing need to flow before it's considered to be WOTUS? And the top right is one that I don't think could ever be considered um, uh, regulated as WOTUS because it's from Mars. But it looks like you know something that you know we're talking about now, so I thought it was fun. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about implications and then and uh, yeah, what it means. Thanks, Andre. Uh, you did a good job setting it up. This is not an easy or necessarily very interesting topic, except for those nerds like us that uh, live and breathe this. So thanks for the intro. So I'm I'm going to focus on why does this matter? Why should you care? How could it really affect you? There's a hand up. Are we taking questions now or later? Oh, hand went down. Okay. That is so great. Thank you. So why do we care about this? Well, one of the reasons is that um, as, as public agencies, we are undertaking new projects quite often. And when we undertake those projects, you know, we're looking at the geography of where the physical project will be located. Is there a water body there? And this second case now gives us different questions rather than, than asking about a significant nexus uh, and the nature of that water body. We're looking at that water body and asking, is the water body relatively permanent? Is there a, a if not, is it connected to a stream, a lake, uh, or a river that could be considered traditionally navigable? And um, if, if there is this relatively permanent flow, which again is a question about how permanent, how relative is that permanence? Um, does it have a surface connection to that upstream or downstream traditionally navigable water? If you answered yes in some way to these, that there is a relatively permanent stream that has a continuous surface connection, 
then that triggers a number of other uh, regulatory actions um, and analyses that would need to be conducted. For example, there might be endangered species, as Andre mentioned, um, and their habitat might be present. Um, there might be mitigation requirements. Um, if you're going to be dredging or filling the water body, you might be looking at a Section 404 permit. If your project will discharge in, during operations and maintenance, you might need a Section 402 NPDES or TIPDES permit for the, for the operation. Those are actually um, sort of the easier ways out of this. Um, if you have a yes, you know what you need to do. If, you, if you're not sure whether there's a relatively permanent stream or whether that stream has a continuous surface connection, then SACIT presents more difficulties, at, at least at this point in time, because um, you're then left with a risk assessment question. How likely do we think it is that uh, this water could be considered jurisdictional? If we're under a time crunch, do we move forward without guidance from the Army Corps and EPA? Um, there's also a, a sort of a timing challenge because if you certainly have a no to these questions and you don't have a jurisdictional water on your hands, the uh, consultation process for endangered species can actually take longer. So there's a number of challenges that, that we are now reconsidering or new challenges um, now that we have these new tests from SACIT when you're looking at new construction. <clears throat> On the next slide, you know, we also need to think about our existing projects. So the, the analysis focuses on the same kinds of questions. You know, is our existing wastewater treatment plant discharging, for example, into a traditional water? If so, you know, we're, you're probably in the same regulatory world. If, however, your wastewater treatment plant is discharging into a dry stream, that was covered under the significant nexus test and has a 402 permit, um, you know, there may be some more analysis that needs to be done for the operation of that, of that project, because it's possible that the permanence of the flow in that dry creek could just be from the effluent, for example. And um, Maybe a new, maybe new factors will be coming out from from the Army Corps and the EPA that might cause us to reconsider the appropriateness of that of that 402 permit, for example. So, same thing with the continuous surface connection. Um, one of the questions that I have um, that'll come up probably on a later on a later slide is, um, what if a continuous surface connection is artificial and your project actually creates the connection between what was once an isolated wetland or an isolated lake and a traditionally navigable water. Have you now extended or artificially extended uh, jurisdiction to that otherwise isolated water body? So, you know, these are questions that your current and new projects um, are going to be triggering uh, with your legal team and your consultants as they come up. So let's look at some examples to kind of put this in context. The next slide, here we go. These are, these are two examples of different ways that um, flood waters are managed. Um, in both of them, they've, are, they've been channelized. So these are artificial or at least modified uh, structures. And I think in this case, the question that we really need to look at is um, whether, whether there were um, these flows to begin with when this project was undertaken. Or was this flood control project placed in dry land and is completely artificial? That said, um, I do think there's still an open question as to what happens now that you've created this potentially continuous surface connection if there's a relatively permanent flow in the flood channel. That could happen if groundwater infiltration, for example, is getting into these flood control channels. Another example, um, are uh, aqueducts, irrigation canals and ditches. Sometimes like on the right, these ditches can be dry and you can drive your lawnmower right through them. Um, but like on the left, you, you may or may not have a relatively permanent supply of water that creates that connection between 
uh, a traditionally navigable water. So we're still left with some questions. Um, one of the bigger ones I think that we will need to consider in Texas is on the next slide, which is um, our mixed use projects. You know, um, the Texas Water Development Board and um, the Texas legislature are really focusing on developing new sources of water for our state and its intensely growing population. Um, and these new sources of water are going to be a combination of, of supplies. Um, and some of it might be recycled water. Some of it, it might be um, aquifer storage and recovery. We might be treating, um, treating our flows through artificial wetlands. All of these projects have some connection to a water body of some sort. And what Sackett has done is just changed the whole analysis, changed the nature of the questions we need to be asking about our new and existing projects as we are planning what kinds of regulations we need to make sure that they're meeting. So, uh, the, the last slide that I've got is um, some implications. I, I sort of hit on some of them um, when it comes to projects, and those are very physical, sort of, in my, in my mind, obvious questions. The implications on this slide to me are a little bit um, more nuanced. So one question that we're going to be watching is what role will um, the former Supreme Court case of Maui County versus Hawaii Wildlife Fund have. In Maui County, the Supreme Court said that um, if a point source is discharging to, say, groundwater, which is not a jurisdictional water, Without an but, that, but that discharge eventually oh, okay, reaches a jurisdictional that. water. Got somebody not muted. Can everybody make sure to mute themselves? Thank you. I'm looking, you know, I get the. All right, so so if you're discharging through groundwater, let's say, or through a water that's not necessarily continuously flowing or connected, uh, but eventually it, it does reach, even if it's through groundwater or through a non-jurisdictional water, um, that discharge could be subject to Clean Water Act Section 402 and require a TIP DES or NPDES permit. And so, um, you know, I guess one question I have is whether Maui can sort of function as a backdoor to regulating uh, certain operations that uh, public agency clients are, are undertaking. With Section 402, um, this is actually sort of the flip side of it. If, if that wastewater treatment plant you're operating is discharging to a dry creek uh, and is currently covered by a 402 permit, could is there a possibility now that you you actually don't need that and maybe some of the expenses in, in the monitoring and reporting and all of that, the testing could be reduced by um, eliminating the, the NPDES portion of the, of the permit? I think that's another question to consider. Um, the, the third point is a question about local regulatory authority over water and water quality. Um, Sackett definitely uh, will result in a constriction of protection of environmental protections over water quality. And so it's left to the states and, and potentially local governments to step in and fill those shoes. In Texas, um, uh, the state law does not exceed federal law. So as the federal law rolls back, so does the environmental regulation in Texas, which leaves a question of what role then does a local agency play? This is potentially complicated by the super preemption bill that was just passed in the 88th legislature. So if you are considering stepping in in, in your agency to, to fill the gap and regulate where the federal law has rolled back, um, that's just something to be aware of and take caution with. And the final point um, has to do with Chevron deference. So I think Lowry's going to talk in just a second about um, the, the new regulations that we're expecting to, to implement the uh, Sackett decision. Well, coming up in the next Supreme Court session is a case of Loper Bright Enterprises. And that case will put before the Supreme Court squarely how much deference do federal agencies receive from courts when they adopt regulations like the one that we're expecting to come out of the Army Corps and the EPA. So um, with that, I will turn it over, I think, to Lowry 
or Andre, I'm not sure who's taken this slide. Andre, you're muted. Thank you. I just wanted to wrap what our key takeaways are here so far. Um, and that is, you know, a water is a WOTUS. Again, if it's a stream, river, ocean, or lake that is used for navigation and commerce, or it flows across or forms part of the state boundaries, these are the traditional navigable waters. Um, it, it will be uh, WOTUS if it's a relatively permanent, standing, or continuously flowing stream, river, or lake that maintains a continuous surface connection to a traditional navigable water or it is a wetland that is relatively permanent and maintains a continuous surface connection to a traditional level of water. So that, again, black ladder there. We'll go to the next slide. So if you're looking at existing and completed projects, again, our focus a lot of the time has been on infrastructure and what does this mean for municipalities, flood control agencies? Um, you've got to look at what is the nature of that infrastructure? Was it, when you think back to some of the slides we had of the storm drains, was that originally a creek that's been channelized? Or was it just sort of a low point that happened to get developed and it made sense to divert the water over there? What was it originally? Can it be called in ordinary terms, a stream, river, lake, or wetland? There was a big part of the second case that focused on that. And I think that we need to pay you know, attention to the fact that things are called things because of what they are in, a, in an odd way, um, and, and it matters. So the second step would be, is it relatively permanent? Is it, you know, is there continuous flow in it? What is that? And is that connection, is that flow connecting down to a traditional level of water? One of the, again, another type of infrastructure you can think about is a road cut. You can build a road through a hill, you cut the hill, all of a sudden the groundwater is pouring out into the gutter on the side of the road and it connects all the way down to, you know, the ocean. Is that enough? So these, these are questions that are, you have to analyze with, in terms of what does it mean for your infrastructure? So with that, I want to hand it to Lowry. He's going to talk about the next steps and where we're going on this. Thanks, Andre. Um, so after the Supreme Court's uh, decision the, uh, uh, in Sackett uh, last month, the uh, uh, EPA and Army Corps of Engineers said they were working to issue a, a new regulation uh, defining what waters the United States says. The, the Biden administration, EPA, and Army Corps uh, back in January of this year, had finalized their regulation um, defining what was a waters United States. Um, in that regulation, they spent a lot of time uh, discussing uh, what is a relatively permanent water, uh, even though uh, most waters in a gray area at the time uh, would be classified as waters the United States under the Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test. Um, and although the Sackett decision focused on uh, the, the facts before it were a wetland and whether it was connected, um, when the court got rid of the significant nexus test, that left for ephemeral and intermittent streams um, that normally, at least ephemerals, were generally classified under the significant nexus test. Uh, now, the question is not significant nexus and whether they are relatively permanently flowing bodies of water. Um, the, the rule spent a lot of time actually defining what was relatively permanent, uh, I think because the um, agencies were anticipating and wanted to be prepared for a world where the significant nexus test no longer existed. They, they, they thought that the Supreme Court might be going this direction. So they have, uh, said now both in testimony and in court that they are going to issue a new regulation respond adjusting their regulation for the Sackett decision by September 1st of this year. Um, it's interesting because um, normally um, they would propose something, take comment on it, and then finalize it. They've said that they feel a sense of urgency and are just going to go directly to a final rule by September 1st, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, in the next couple of slides. But uh, meanwhile, until they've done that, um, they announced that uh, most uh, jurisdictional determinations where they approve that something is not you know, part of the Clean Water Act, uh, are on pause, you know, while they uh, work on their new regulations. Um, and back in 2006, after the Rapanos case was handed down, uh, the Corps and EPA actually paused jurisdictional determinations for over a year 
which you know caused some backups and delays for a lot of project proponents. Um, so far, if, if they restart them after issuing the rule by September 1st, it'll just be a you know month and a half, two month pause uh, before they start again. So that'll be a little bit faster, but that assumes that um, whatever rule that they issue, um, you know, survives legal challenges and, and that sort of thing. So next slide. So that leaves the question of what is considered relatively permanent. And we've got basically three or four different standards for relatively permanent that's going to have to get sorted out between the agencies and their interpretation and then the courts and ultimately the Supreme Court if it goes there. But just looking back at how, going back to Scalia and Rapanos in 2006, how people were thinking about what is relatively permanent and what is not. Scalia basically set, had it put out an example that if a, a stream is flowing for three, 290 days out of the year, it's relatively permanent. If it's flowing for a day after a rain event, and, and then it's not relatively permanent. But then he also said ephemeral and intermittent streams are not relatively permanent. Um, then in 2008, when EPA and the Army Corps issued their guidance on applying Rapanos, they said relatively permanent is that it typically, in a typical year, has continuous flow, at least seasonally, e.g. three months out of the year. So um, they kind of ignored the ephemeral and intermittent stream standard being not relatively permanent and at least under Kennedy's significant nexus test. Uh, or at least, uh, you know, applying more broadly the, the opin opinion said that relatively permanent is three months. Then we come to January and the Biden administration's definition of WOTUS, their regulation, and they said relatively permanent equals flows for more than a short duration in res direct response to precipitation. They also said that streams that dry within days following a storm are not relatively permanent. So that is a broader group of water bodies and streams that would be considered relatively permanent. They also said um, that they, in different regions of, of the country, were going to use a method of determining what was relatively permanent, depending on the hydrology that prevails in that part of the country. And they call that, that tool a stream flow duration assessment method, or SDAM. Um, in the Northwest, there's an approved SDAM that it can be used today. Um, but as we see on the next slide, um, that's the only one that's been completed and approved for use for determining what is uh, relatively permanent. Um, there are beta versions or versions of these tools in the works in the other parts of the country that you'll see on this map. Um, and of course, for uh, the DFW area, um, it's split between two different uh, regions of the country and it's not exactly clear where the line is going to be drawn. There's a, just kind of a very smooth line going through it, but as we know, the actual uh, uh, you know, uh, geography is, is not that smooth going through the middle of the state of Texas. So it'll be, it, one initial question will be, uh, depending on where you're located, which of these SDAM tools am I supposed to use? Um, for both the Great Plains one, which is on the purple and, and kind of brownish area, and then the Southeast one, which is in the dark green area, there are beta tools that you can go online and see what kind of questions there would have your experts ask and what kind of forms they would uh, fill out to, to answer. Uh, but basically most of them are looking at uh, is there the presence of vegetation in the water body that tends to live when something has water in it for a good portion of the year? Um, and is there a, you know, a bed and bank uh, and just other site-specific characteristics that would then inform um, this question of whether it's relatively permanent? Okay, next slide. So the next step, according to the core and EPA, is that they're going to go directly to a final rule without doing notice or comment. Um, that is going to subject uh, the new rule to an Administrative Procedures Act challenge uh, almost inevitably. 
Um, and so I just wanted, in addition to any challenge to the substance of where they landed, um, just wanted to put forth what the standard is for being able to go to that uh, final rule without notice and comment. Um, first, I'll say that sometimes agencies, when they do this, they it, provide for a comment period after um, they issue the final rule and say that they'll make adjustments based on any significant comments that they receive, or at least consider significant comments and consider making adjustments. So, so we may see that uh, as well, but regardless, um, what they have to do is ha include a finding that they have good cause that having notice and comment before issuing a final rule is impractical, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. Um, courts have generally viewed this ability to go straight to the final rule and construed it narrowly. Um, and as, as we say, see here, the DC Circuit said it should be narrowly construed and only reluctantly countenanced. Um, they've also said that it's generally limited to emergency situations where delay could result in serious harm, uh, to usually to life or health. Um, and a court will only agree in rare circumstances when the ordinary procedures um, would in fact harm the public interest that they're trying to serve. So that's a standard that they will have to meet if they're sub if and when they're subject to legal challenge for going straight to a final rule. Um, next slide. So as I said, uh, and in the meantime, the Army Corps has paused uh, issuing ju jurisdictional determinations or, or what they call approved jurisdictional determinations um, while the new regulation is pending. Um, we know that uh, the SACA decision will shrink the scope of federal jurisdiction for many areas and many types of water bodies. Um, but as Andre and Rebecca pointed out, there's still a lot of open questions and gray areas. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of interpretations that's going to have to happen. In some cases, depending on where you are in your process, it may make sense to go ahead and do what they call a preliminary jurisdictional determination, or basically just presume that there's jurisdiction so that you can get your permit and get your project going. In other cases, it may make sense to invest the time uh, and the experts to uh, support an approved jurisdictional determination that relieves you of Clean Water Act jurisdiction, just depending on the timeline and urgency of your project. Next slide. So that concludes it. So we'd like to open up to any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. And as Lowry said, we will now take time for questions. You can ask a question in one of two ways. You can use the raise your hand button at the top of your screen, and I will call on you, and then you will unmute your microphone and ask your question. Or you can just type your question in the chat, and I will read it to the speakers. So are there any questions? Don't be shy. We have these great speakers here. They're willing to take your questions. Okay, I see one coming in from Nathan Davison. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question. Or Yes, uh, okay. however the waters of the United States are defined, if there is a source of uh, contamination in the water, say, if the the Trinity River we know is waters of the United States and and whether there's a there's a stream that that is or not um, if if contamination is detected in the river and we can trace it upstream to a particular source we still hold them accountable so the this would only uh, that that that's correct and, and then this would whether something is waters of the United States only determines if it's we have to get like a 404 permit or something like that. Is that right? Um, well, no, I think in certain circumstances, and I'll let Rebecca and Lowry add to this too, but in cert certain circumstances, they may not be a basis for regulating that pollutant. I mean, it depends on how it comes in. There's a lot of, this is why Ma uh, Rebecca mentioned the Maui case. Imagine, I don't know, some industrial plant discharging a pollutant 
onto the ground, seeps into the groundwater, then seeps into a stream that flows into the Trinity River. You detect it in the Trinity River, you're going to come upstream, you're going to find it, and it's coming out of the side of the hill because it's in the groundwater. But you trace it further and you find the industrial plant because they're the only ones using that nearby. Where's your Clean Water Act is on its, you know, from the starting point is going to have a hard time applying to that. The Maui case that Rebecca mentioned holds that if if the discharge is the effectively the same thing as going directly into the into the waters of the United States, then you can assert Clean Water Act jurisdiction. But if it's far away and it's taken like a long time to travel through the ground, you might not have basis for jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act there. You might have to use something else like products liability or or super fund or something. But anyway, Rebecca, you're about to add. Yeah, that it, thanks for that, Andre. That was the first part of, of what I would have said. The second part is um, I also mentioned that local regulation might now be the place to step up and fill the gap where the federal law uh, has pulled back. And um, so depending on what type of agency you're with, Nathan, <clears throat> you may or may not have an inherent authority to pursue these kinds of um, pollutants if you have jurisdiction over the, the water or the pollutant source. But um, one thing that we have helped some of our clients do is actually act as a citizen in a citizen suit under the Clean Water Act. Um, this doesn't happen very often, but it is coming up uh, slightly more frequently than it has in the past. So um, public agencies that find themselves sort of with their hands tied under state laws and maybe under um, this cutback regulatory world under the Clean Water Act still might be able to take um, enforcement actions in that way as well. Okay, thank you. And it uh, looks like we have a question from Michelle Wood Ramirez. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question. Hey, uh, thanks for the webinar. It's been really informative. I'm putting my ecology hat on um, and I'm just recalling some of the stuff that I studied in grad school. And you had mentioned that um, it might change the permits for wastewater releases, but um, even the Rio Grande and maybe even the Trinity River rely heavily on that. So that would, with climate change and drought, wouldn't that even remove the big rivers from this if the presence absence of water is the only determinant? I think this is this is really tough. Think about the Los Angeles River or or I mean Rio Grande's a great one or 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 the little Colorado, you know, that these things dry up in certain times of the year or certain places. And what is what is enough? I mean that the fact that they've been called rivers and treated as such is supposed to mean something under this decision, but we're not sure what, honestly. I don't know. Okay, yeah, because that would be really scary if things weren't permitted anymore, like tracing it back. I'm a watershed coordinator, so it's all literally connected. So anyway, well, I, I just I think you're really you're weird. definitely right about the interconnection, especially in the more arid areas where you might have environmental flows that rely on that consistent effluent discharge to sustain some kind of a base flow. So. Um, you might be looking at a series or a, a number of overlapping environmental concerns to consider. Yeah, and rivers are made from rainwater, which is stormwater. So everything is, it seems really weird if it doesn't rain in the future, if we have more flashier floods, which that's what Texas is predicted, then like nothing will be protected if we don't like there's not even nexus to where the water drains it's just presence absence so anyway thanks for letting me ask my question but that was my understanding from what you mentioned i, I think your question raises two really great points though i, I want i don't want to lose a chance to reference some there's a massive disconnect between science and water and how the hydrologic cycle and how it's regulated under federal law in this country it just doesn't add up you know and un unfortunately that's the landscape we're dealing with and, and we just have to work with it. The other one is back to Rebecca's point is that cities and counties are going to have some tools, you know, and that they in water districts even maybe have tools under state law that that they're going to maybe want to use one way or another to provide protections uh, because the, the federal government's coming back. Some states that was that was one of the arguments that a lot of people made. The states are supposed to step in here and the federal government's supposed to step back. Some states are doing that, others are not, and it's it's creating a patchwork. Thank you. 
Cool. Thank you. Okay, I see a question from Ronald Cox. Go ahead and unmute, ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my question. You know, I, I have a very large, uh, I guess this is personal and professional, but I have a very large farm in East Texas that actually flows into a lake that I'm adjacent to. And so does that mean a lot of the blue lines that are on my farm show up as navigable waters of the U.S. go away? And would that be the same for Dallas? I can take a shot at it. I mean, without seeing your property, it'd be really hard to tell. Plus, we're not scientists in this capacity. So again, it'd be really hard to tell. But generally speaking, you know, if it's if there's permanent, relatively permanent flow and a continuous surface connection down to that lake, and then that lake itself has surface connection down to another river, down to the ocean, et cetera. You know, unless there's full control and those blue lines are actually irrigation canal, irrigation ditches that were built in dry land originally, they're likely going to be regulated as quotas. But I don't know, uh, Rebecca or, or Lowry, do you have any thoughts? Well, it would be no different than, you know, taking all the tributaries that flow into the Trinity River away from, you know, it, it, I just use my farm as a very small example. But if you look at something larger like the Trinity River, which, you know, cuts right through Dallas County, you know, would, would we see an absence or uh, an elimination because the dry periods that some of those creeks or channels may encounter in a dry year like we went 69 days without rain last year and now we're on our 25th or 27th day of no rain this year but you know that didn't prevent us from having two snow events here in texas over the last couple of years that were you know set records and we all either did or didn't have electricity and i don't want to drag my question out too long but but it, you know, it just bears on a, a bigger question. All those tributaries that are coming into the main river, which doesn't hold up too too well in itself in a wet period, you know, all of a sudden we're going we're going to just negate all those tributaries that run into there. Yeah, I think what I'd say is that is that we're asking a, di a different and narrower question, whether it's the, the you know, the, the blue lines on your farm or the tributaries to the Trinity. Um, instead of saying, is there some significant nexus where there's a biological or chemical or hydrological connection that you would ask, a, you know, an environmental a scientist to, to take a look at um, and, and tended to kind of look with a broadly at connections and then find jurisdiction. Now, we're asking, is there a relatively permanent, a direct surface water connection? We don't look at groundwater connections, not now, we won't. And then the question of relatively permanent, uh, applying this, this tool about the duration. And so if the uh, water body exists, um, you know, not just tied to the a rainstorm within the last few days but it exists outside of that in a typical water year which i know it's harder and harder to know what a typical year is with climate change and and as things change but um if in a typical year it's there you know seasonally or not just in response immediate response days response to a, a rainstorm then i think it will con con be considered jurisdictional. Um, if that connection only occurs in a day or two after uh, a rainstorm, then I think under this new test, it will no longer be considered jurisdictional. Well, you can, you can almost say every street that has inlets in it is is uh, a waterway. I, I think that, and this has happened with the past Supreme Court cases too that it that it almost raises as many questions as it as it answers but it does answer some <laughs> and i'm going to go ahead and wrap up i apologize i'm just seeing the questions in the chat but after i wrap up um andre can stick around for about 
five minutes afterward and we can we can address those uh, questions in the chat. So if you can stick around after I wrap up, we'll take care of those questions. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, if you RSVP and registered for this webinar, you will receive the follow up emails from me. And I'm also going to put a link to a survey in the chat. If you could please provide us your honest feedback about this webinar on what we can do to improve or provide uh, future topic ideas, we'd love to hear them. And I'd like to thank you all again for joining and listening in. And many, many thanks to our speakers, Andre Monet, Rebecca Andrews, and Lowry Cook. Without you, this webinar would not even be possible. And I am very grateful. Thank you. And thank you to all attendees. And with that, this webinar is now over. But with that, we will take some additional questions if you can stick around. Um, we'll just go ahead and start answering them. I know some of you have to leave for time. So we will go ahead um, uh, with a question. Sure seems that we have anybody here. OK, sorry. OK, yeah, to assume question. that the equivalent to agreeing to go to jail until proven innocent, you want to address that? Remarks. Yeah, this is a good one. This is a great question. It, it seems like you're you're just assuming that you have wetlands and you're going to go with it. The reason you would do that is because you're maybe just about to be done with all your design and permit approvals and to restart the analysis over again is going to add two or three years to your project. And maybe you're just fine with doing the mitigation you were required to be have done under that if, if your project was jurisdictional. So, yeah, in a sense, you're assuming that there's wetlands when maybe there weren't. Um, but or maybe it was questionable, but you're doing it because you need to get your project done and that you want to get it done in a timely manner without adding costs and stuff to it. And Andre, I'll just add to that that um, if if you think that you're and you're not in the situation that you said where you're at the very end of a long process and and deciding whether or not to have to go through it again and you're just starting out. Um, if you think that you now have areas that under the new standard are not jurisdictional, um, one way is to go to the core and have them bless and say that they agree with you. And that is that may take a while, but it would give you the greatest degree of certainty that um, by doing a project in that uh, area or potential water body that you're not going to have an enforcement action brought against you. Um, you may decide that that's that you need to move faster than that, and you could decide that you want to take on a little more risk and maybe get a legal opinion from a law firm or lawyer saying, uh, we've looked at it uh, and we, your expert has mapped this and we think under the current law, under the current standard and the, the rule that just issued, it is not jurisdictional, so go forward. And um, you run some risks that the Army Corps and EPA ultimately disagree with you, but if you feel certain enough and there's enough urgency, it may be that that uh, is a way forward. And, and the core regulators who I've spoken to assume that after Sackett that there is going to be some universe of projects where that's exactly what they do, that the core does not get asked to bless it because they feel so certain that now under the new rule, it's no longer jurisdictional. Okay. Thank you. And um, then someone asked, when will the SDM tool become available for our region? And Chandler Peter, our regional contact with the core, answered that and put a link. So thank you for that. And then a uh, question, can you talk more about the super preemptive bill and how this may impact local limits that are not defined by state laws? Yeah, sure, I can take that one. So House Bill 2127, I think it is, is the super preemption bill. And it generally says that uh, it, in terms of local government, you can't adopt an ordinance that is inconsistent with any law of the state. Um, there's a number of codes um, that are called out that you can't be inconsistent with. Um, for example, the Natural Resources Code and the Local Government Code, which I presume would cover a number of the folks who, who've been on this call. And so um, in terms of local limits, 
unless you want to unmute yourself and say otherwise, I assume you're talking about industrial discharges and uh, local limits. Um, you know, you would need to talk to your legal counsel to make sure that they would agree with this answer, but um, local limits are authorized by federal law. And so um, unless there's a specific local, a uh, specific state law establishing a limit um, on the discharge of whatever pollutant it is at issue, federal law would, would I would presume, authorize a local limit um, on, on that particular pollutant discharge. Now, if you're asking about local limits generally, meaning local regulation of water quality and activities that could affect water quality, um, I think the analysis would be a little bit more complicated than that and would involve looking at sort of the source of authority that your agency operates under and um, how you would extend that authority to the activities at issue. So unfortunately, I don't have a very good um, specific answer to um, the question about how a public agency could, how all public agencies could regulate activities that affect water quality because it would be um, agency specific. Okay, thank you for that. And we will take this one last question here. Are there any cases on the current SCOTUS docket or possibly upcoming that would further narrow or less likely expand WOTUS coverage? This is a great one for Rebecca because she previewed it in her in her presentation. <laughs> but so go go for it. Yeah, well, I did. I mentioned the Loper Bright Enterprises case. Um, it is a case where uh, some Fisher industry groups, uh, fishermen, are challenging the National Marine Fisheries Services imposition of a uh, a charge to have a, a monitor present on their boats. The, you're going to wonder where this is going and what it has to do with water quality. Um, but anyway, what that case uh, is asking is, um, since the regulation at issue is silent, it doesn't say anything about who has to pay the expense of those monitors, even though the monitors are clearly required. Um, does does the do the agencies have the the right to interpret and impose the costs on the the fishing industry? So the impact that that decision can have on the scope of the of the Clean Water Act and and expansion of WOTUS is that um, once the uh, agencies come out with their regulation, presumably September 1st, um, you know, whatever that is, whether it's a more broad or a more narrow interpretation, that interpretation itself could be challenged by folks who, who disagree with it. So that's why we're keeping our eyes on the case uh, Loper Bright Enterprises. But I'm not I'm not aware of others directly related to, uh, to or directly addressing WOTUS definition. Thank you for that. That is very helpful. And I see we have a hand raised. So I want to give uh, Joe an opportunity to ask the question. So go ahead and unmute. Thank you for sticking around. No worries. I just have a simple question regarding maintenance of waterway or ditches that may be tied to like uh, Trinity River through a lake, uh, Arlington Lake. I'm just thinking most of our drainage drains to uh, Lake Arlington and then on to the Trinity River, which goes down to the ocean, long story short. Worst case scenario, if 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 we are de deemed in the waters of the U.S., do I have to get a permit for every time I clean out a ditch or will there be some type of exemption for that, uh, that type of, of typical maintenance work that we do in our ditches out in the unincorporated areas of Tarrant County? Who wants to take that one? Lowry? Okay. Um, Flower. I, I think just the question of whether the ditches are jurisdictional or not is going to is going to turn on whether they were uh, built in dry land historically or if they were built in what was already a, you know, would have been considered a jurisdictional water. Um, because for ditches and dry land under the current rule, um, there is an ex specific exemption for for those. Um, and then for maintenance, so if they're if they're not jurisdictional, then you wouldn't need a, at least you wouldn't need a permit from the you know Army Corps of Engineers to to do maintenance in the ditch. Um, for the areas that are jurisdictional, um, the ditches that are typically um, 
there's a, a general permit you can get called a, a nationwide permit that covers routine maintenance of, of infrastructure like ditches. And so you would probably need to go get that permit, but you don't have to go through NEPA or uh, you know so, so all, all of the steps that are covered by an individual permit. Um, there are some limitations on the on the uh, amount of acreage uh, you can that's covered by that permit, but that's what I'd be looking at instead of you know having to get an individual permit for er maintaining every ditch. That answers my question. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I think we've covered all the questions. Let me just do one last check while I have you all here. Yes, it looks like it. So thank you again to our speakers and thank you who's those of you who stuck around and we appreciate our speakers giving us the extra 10 minutes and uh, I'm very grateful to you all and I uh, hope you have uh, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. It's great. Thank you all.